Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, this is another seminar hosted by Lyme Disease UK. And tonight we have the great pleasure of hosting some members of the team from um, MR MRC University of Glasgow, from the Centre for Virus Research. And today our topic will be exploring tick-borne pathogens in Scotland. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping for you is this a session is being recorded, so there's no need to try and take notes. Just listen to what everybody's saying and everybody who's registered will receive a recording and it will appear on our website, LymeDiseaseUK.com as well, with an overview of everything that we've talked about this evening. If everybody attending can please keep their microphones off and the videos off because it's really distracting when um, people are talking. Um, and um, if you could just keep to that, but we do have moderators in the background um, who will make sure that they are switched off or if something comes on all, you know, accidentally, um, the moderators will switch them off. Uh, it's nothing worse than somebody's telephone ringing in the background when you're trying to present something. Uh, so uh, we have two speakers um, and then we'll go to a Q&A. So I just want to introduce the team members who are with us tonight. And I will read this because I couldn't, I couldn't memorize these off by heart, these bios. <laughs> I'm not that good. Uh, so we've got with us Dr. Benjamin Brennan, who's a molecular virologist with an interest in tick-borne viral diseases and how they are transmitted by ticks. His group, funded by the Wellcome Trust, examines how and why ticks have the capacity to spread viruses when they take their blood meals and why ticks don't appear to get sick following infection. We also have with us uh, Professor Roman Beek, Professor of Disease Ecology and Molecular Epidemiology, oh, sorry, gave me some long words here, Roman, epidemiology at the University of Glasgow. His work aims to understand how infectious organisms spread and persist in their respective host populations and how e ecological factors from ho host ecology to landscape, now I had to learn this one, heterogeneity, yeah, affect these processes. Research tends to focus on pathogens that are rapidly evolving, such as viruses and bacteria, and for which transmission dynamics can be tracked using genetic data. He has worked on a wide range of pathogens, included many of the major human health or veterinary concerns, for example, Lyme disease, Ebola, rabies, and bovine TB. We also have with us Faye Watson, who is the Engagement and Communications Coordinator of the MRC University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research. Faye manages a programme of projects, events and activities which raise the voice of many different audiences in the research that is carried out at the CVR on viruses and the diseases they cause, and is probably the founder and initiator of the What Makes Viruses Tick? research project, which we are also interested in. So I'm going to hand over to um, Ben, who's going to go first. So both, uh, not both, myself, um, Roman and Faye will uh, switch off our videos and everything while um, Ben uh, presents his um, PowerPoint and then we'll slowly come back um, and move over to Roman in a minute. So over to you, Ben. I'll just stop my video. Great. I'll uh, try and share my screen. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Can I just check that we're recording, Julia? Because it doesn't say it's recording yet. Oh, it does. Don't worry. Ignore me. Ignore me. <clears throat> okay. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Uh, my name's Ben Brennan. I'm uh, uh, Welcome Trust uh, Fellow at the University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research. So the MRC University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research is a large group of human and veterinary virologists based out of the Garscube campus uh, in the, uh, the University of Glasgow, based in northwest Glasgow, 
uh, geographically. Um, at the CBR, we study everything from human, animal, and zoonotic or vector-borne viruses. And this really covers a wide spectrum from everything from studying the virus genetic material and how viruses replicate uh, replicate this genetic material to spread, to the molecules they use in cells uh, to propagate the replication, to designing new vaccines and antiviral drugs, to all the way to populations and disease in the population. Um, we do this really in the lab, uh, in the wet labs. Uh, we have several clinicians, so we have several clinical virologists, and we also do uh, a, a wide way, range of uh, bioinformatics studies as well, all with the goal of working towards understanding really how understanding viruses and using that knowledge to improve health. So uh, in my group, we, uh, we study three things really. We study ticks, viruses, uh, and vaccines. And how we combine the, those three things is we have a, a Wellcome Trust Henry Dale Fellowship in which we uh, really conduct studies to understand how and why viruses are transmitted by ticks. And then on the flip side of that, we also aim to really look at how these viruses are controlled by the tick immune responses. So what's kind of quite special, and we'll get onto that later on in the presentation, is that some of the viruses that we work on cause quite severe human disease yet they don't really seem to cause any detrimental effects to the ticks that transmit them. So we, we really want to understand how these two different systems, in these two different systems, a virus can cause severe disease and in another system it can't. So we're really utilizing and try, really trying to aim to understand that. What we also do is we also aim to use our understanding of virus biology and a technique that we've we and others have pioneered called reverse genetics, which allows us to manipulate the virus genome to really study how the, how the virus functions and how, what the virus needs to be able to replicate itself. And we can really use that knowledge then to develop better, uh, more novel uh, vaccines and vaccines that can be used uh, as live attenuated vaccines to elicit a really good and really strong, robust immune response. But what we're here today to talk about is, is the tick side of the work. Um, and so that's, well, that's what I will focus the rest of the talk on. So my lab is relatively new. We started in 2018 and we're composed as six of us at the moment. So there's two postdocs, Mazia and Maureen, two PhD students, Alex and Andrew, a technician whose job it is to look after our live tick colonies in the lab, uh, and then myself. So we all together, we study a range of different viruses uh, called Bunya viruses. Um, most people won't have heard of them. They're, they're fairly obscure, but despite being fairly obscure, there are over 350 different Bunya viruses. And these are split into 12 virus families and 46 genera. And you can kind of get an idea of the Bunya virus family tree shown here in this phylogenetic tree of how distantly related they all are all are to each other. And in this phylogenetic tree, my group is specifically focused on members of the Fenue viridae, which are shown here in the red. So what, it, what, is it, what is a Bunya virus? What does it look like? Well, the cartoon on the right really gives you a, a kind of idea uh, of what the Bunya viruses look like. They're very small round particles, so they have two spike proteins uh, in, their, in their cell surface and their genetic material is split over three different parts uh, called creatively called small, medium and large. Um, what's really interesting about these viruses, in particular the Fenui viruses, which we study, is that most Bunya viruses are transmitted by arthropods. And by arthropods, we mean uh, insects or, or, or ticks or other biting flies. So therefore, they're a group of viruses known as arbor, arboviruses, which is arthropod born. And as I said, this can be either mosquitoes or biting flies, sand flies or, or midges. But what we're all here today to talk about is uh, they can be transmitted and spread by ticks. So the other reason that we study Bunya viruses and primarily, I mean, if I'm honest, the main reason we study Bunya viruses is they do cause a lot of disease. There's 350 of them or over 350 of them and they all cause 
a, a range of different diseases. And this can be uh, fever, uh, inflammation of the brain. There are certain viruses that can cause abortion uh, in pregnant animals uh, if should they become infected. There are viruses that cause uh, stomach upset, such as gastroenteritis. Um, and then getting towards the more serious end, um, we have viruses that can cause acute respiratory distress. So, you know, if similar symptoms along the lines of the coronavirus uh, that has uh, uh, been part of our lives for the last two years. They, and then the, the very serious end, we have viruses that can cause very severe hemorrhagic fever. And these are viruses such as Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is tick transmitted. And then a virus that we'll come on to in, in a second uh, that my lab focuses on. Also importantly, um, these diseases, these viruses also can cause uh, diseases in plants, and these are generally uh, commercial plants, uh, cash crops, uh, such as uh, potato and tobacco. So they're quite important, not just for, for human and veterinary health, but also for plant health uh, as well, with uh, economic importance. So the virus that my lab really focuses on is a virus with a horrific name. Um, it's a severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome virus or SFTSV. Um, it's been recently renamed and it's had many names in the literature should you care to take a look, but its current name is Dabi Banda virus and it's uh, internal politics in the country that it was discovered in that, that keeps the name changing. Um, but it's, it's a member of the Finui viridae family uh, it's spread by the bite of an infected hematophagous tick, uh, in particular ticks uh, of the species Hemaphysalis longicornis. And you can see our ladies uh, here it, that we have in the lab. Uh, There's a video taken by my PhD student. Um, and uh, th this, is the, this is the tick species, along with several others that are responsible for transmitting SFTSV. Uh, in, in the affected countries. Unfortunately, SFTSV has quite a high mortality rate. Um, it's very dependent on the phenotype or the type of virus that you get infected with. And case fatality rates can be as high as 27 to 30% uh, in certain affected countries. So it's a pretty serious, pretty serious disease uh, transmitted by the tick. Fortunately for us, the current geographical location of this virus is, is really in East Asia, where Haemaphysalis longicornis is. And the virus was first discovered over a decade ago now in China, but since then it's been isolated and found in other countries in East Asia, such as Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and most recently in, in Taiwan. And there have been approximately 15,000 cases of SFTSV disease uh, uh, since it was discovered in 2009. What's concerning and what's what the reason we SFTSV is such a hot topic to study and it is one of the pathogens highlighted by the World Health Organization as uh, priority pathogens in 2018 is really the ticks. They are an invasive species of tick and they ha are moving uh, across, across the world. Um, and so, we really, we really uh, need to keep an eye on them, and uh, you know, just monitor where they're going to see where the disease, you know, see the diseases that follow with them. Um, so SFTSV has quite nasty symptoms. You have a very high fever, muscle ache, a deficiency of platelets and white blood cells, and then uh, in more severe cases, it can lead to gastrointestinal bleeding, cerebral hemorrhage, multi organ failure, which are, you know, in a third of patients can be fatal. So why, so how do we study this in the lab? What, what are we trying to answer? We really want to understand why these viruses infect ticks and why they infect tick cells. And we've got some really interesting data that actually shows that these viruses are unable to infect mosquito cells in the lab or in culture. So that could give us, you know, at really at the fundamental molecular, at the fundamental cellular level, that these viruses are blocked from being transmitted by other arthropods or, or, or insects. And we're really trying to understand why that might be the case. Once the virus has got into the tick cells, um, we don't understand yet how the cell controls infection. So, and uh, how that infection uh, leads to a persistence within the tick and allowing it to transmit once it takes its blood mail. We're really looking at how and why the tick cells are controlling virus replication, suppressing it to a level that's not detrimental to the ticks. 
We're also maintaining uh, tick colonies in the lab. We've got three species of ticks now, and we are working on protocols and processes to allow us to feed these ticks in the lab. And you can see an example here of an unfed uh, Haemaphysalis tick. And then uh, one of our ladies, uh, after she's had a blood meal, uh, get, she increased by about a hundred fold in, uh, increase in size. And then finally, um, with reverse genetics, we can really aim to study how virus replication occurs in live ticks. So we can engineer viruses to express fluorescent markers uh, on their surface. So when we put that virus into a blood meal and let, the, let it go into the tick, we can see very quickly or see in real time how the tick is getting infected, what organs are getting infected in, in the tick. And then very, then after a period of time, how much virus comes out and what after what time period the virus comes out of the live ticks. So we're, again, we're really going from all the way from cell cultures to, to, live, to live ticks in, in our studies. And then the other part of what we do is our public engagement project, which uh, we've already been, already been introduced, which is what makes viruses tick. So the aim is to really raise awareness of ticks and tick-borne diseases across Scotland. And with that knowledge, we want to empower the people of Scotland and the UK further afield to make informed decisions when accessing the outdoors to, and to access uh, the outdoors safely uh, with regards to ticks. And then we finally, we're really asking the public to report tick sightings uh, so we can upload them to our tick map and, and get a real idea of where the ticks are in each season to allow us to go and collect them. The other thing we want to do is really raise awareness of ticks and tick biology and their ecology and how they behave um, to give people a better understanding uh, for, for accessing the outdoors. A part of that is to introduce you to all the, the range of different bacteria and viruses that these ticks can transmit. We want to tell you how to remove them safely and how not to remove them um, uh, and to, you know, to, to keep people safe when they're accessing the outdoors. So we would like uh, people to submit their sightings to our, uh, our website uh, with our partners, the TCB. So when you're, you're out walking and you come across a tick, we would like you to submit uh, a photo and a location, if you can, uh, of the ticks. Um, and that will allow us then to really target our uh, tick collections to supplement our tick colonies in the lab and, and, and help us uh, build up our tick numbers because ticks, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which way you look at it, breed quite slowly. Um, so it takes us a while to build up our colonies to be able to do our studies. So we have to supplement them with field court ticks. Um, and so finally, uh, so that's it really. Uh, please uh, submit a ticket through the web link uh, shown and um, please, please don't, don't send them to us, <laughs> just the photos. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you really very much, Ben, that was really interesting. Um, if you can just, that's it, come out of screen sharing. That's really brilliant. And I, I've already sitting here, sitting here writing a load of questions, so watch out. <laughs> Um, we're now going to go over to Professor Roman Beek, and he's going to present his PowerPoint. So over to you, Roman, and I'll click off again. Great. Thanks very much. Um, just get the presentation up and running. Right, just to check, can you see this okay? Yeah, I can see the slides. Great, thank you. Um, well, yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, as uh, Julia was saying in the introduction, uh, I'm an ecologist by, by training and uh, in my research, I'm uh, really interested in how uh, infectious organisms spread through, through their host populations. Um, so this is natural populations of, of animals largely. Um, and the diseases that, that we study uh, include Lyme disease, but also some other zoonotic and, and, and livestock pathogens. Uh, so today I just want to um, offer a, a quick overview of kind of like what we're interested in, the kind of questions that we're asking uh, about Lyme disease specifically from the perspective of uh, ecology and, and, and evolution. Um, and I want to start, um, so I should mention that um, I'm also based at the University of Glasgow, as you heard. Um, but based in the Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine. So we, we study pathogens 
um, largely from um, uh, a population epidemiological uh, perspective, um, but also down to the molecular level. Uh, so there's definitely overlap with some of the interests uh, that uh, Ben was describing. So I want to start by um, showing the, the tick life cycle, which I'm sure uh, people in this audience will be well familiar with, but by going over it, uh, it helps to understand uh, the, the different type of players that are involved. Uh, and that is a useful way to illustrate what kind of questions we're, we're interested in. Uh, so when a tick hatches from, from an egg mass, uh, the, the larva needs to, to find its first blood meal. Um, and that uh, tends to be a small mammal or, or a bird. Um, and at that point, the larva can become infected if the host that it took its blood meal from uh, carried uh, the pathogen. Um, so this is the specific example of, of Lyme disease here with uh, Borrelia burgdorferi being present in the host and, and the larva becoming infected. That larva then molds into a nymph um, and carries the, the pathogen at that point. So um, the next time it takes its uh, next blood meal, so as a nymph, it needs to feed again. Um, to progress uh, in, its, in its development. And so now when it feeds on a host that's uninfected uh, and takes its blood meal, it might pass on the pathogen to that uninfected host. And that, um, that host we therefore call the transmission host because that is what completes the life cycle from uh, the Borrelia pathogen perspective. Uh, it needs to get into a tick, but then it needs to get out of the tick back into a vertebrate host. Um, so that's the transmission cycle. But of course, we care about this because the transmission, uh, the infected nymph um, can also feed on uh, another type of host, such as a human being, uh, and thereby cause uh, Lyme disease. But if it feeds on one of its natural hosts, um, like a, a mouse or, or a bird at that point, um, then it can mold into uh, an adult female. The females tend to take their blood meal from some of the larger bodied animals, such as deer, um, and it needs those big blood meals to, to then um, have the energy to, to lay another egg mass, completing the tick life cycle. So the large bodied hosts like deer are essential for the tick to reproduce, and therefore we refer to those hosts often as reproduction hosts. So we're interested in these different types of hosts, uh, and we're also um, asking how do environmental changes that influence the populations of these hosts affect our risk of becoming exposed to the pathogen causing Lyme. Um, and some of these environmental changes uh, are things like invasive species. So we have shown that gray squirrels, invasive gray squirrels, for example, are competent um, reservoirs of, of some uh, Lyme disease pathogens. Uh, woodland regeneration is uh, the is sort of large scale um, uh, programs to, to regenerate woodlands across the country for very good reasons, sort of climate uh, adaptation, for example, but that means we're changing host communities and uh, potentially creating habitats in which the Lyme disease pathogen can be maintained um, more easily. Uh, urban greening is another um, example of where we're changing our, our environment um, to create more recreational space, but that, of course, also means that we're creating spaces in which uh, potential reservoir species for, for Lyme disease and, and ticks um, could exist. And deer are, are central to that uh, because deer, they are often linked uh, to where we find ticks. And, and all of that is, is influenced by the effect of climate change, of course. So these are some of the issues that we, we care about and that we're trying to understand in, in, in our research. And uh, a useful way to, to, to think about this is, is by remembering that uh, the tick, Ixodes ricinus in, in Europe, that's the main vector for, for Lyme disease, is really a generalist tick species. It can feed on, on lots of different uh, vertebrate species and take its blood meal from that. And that's really what makes it such an important uh, and efficient vector, uh, because it can pick up the infection from, from one host. Uh, and then when it takes its, not, its next blood meal, it might transfer um, the pathogen to a completely different host or to the same one as I showed when, when it fulfills the transmission cycle. So one of our key questions is which of the host species in, in a community where we have lots of different bird species, lots of different small mammals and large mammal species, which of these hosts are really critical for maintaining tick populations and for maintaining the, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease? And Theoretically, we could imagine if, if we could remove some, some of these hosts one by one, 
um, but we still see ticks um, being being maintained and the pathogen circulating, then that would tell us that um, the host that we can remove, they're probably not as, as important, they're not critical for the maintenance, but they're, there are some hosts uh, which we remove those, or if we control those, then uh, we might see uh, a real change in um, either the abundance and, and distribution of ticks or, or of the pathogen. Um, so we're really interested in, in which host species these are whenever we look at a, at a community of uh, different wildlife, and in some cases, domestic species. And this brings us again back to this um, concept of we have a, a transmission host and a reproduction host. Uh, the transmission host is what's important for pathogen persistence. And the, the reproduction host is the one that, that maintains the tick population. So for each of those, we can ask which ones can we take away and which ones are really critical for maintaining the ticks uh, or the pathogen. One of the, we, we work in, in a, range of different areas within Scotland. So we have projects in, in different places, but one of our main projects is in the Western Isles. And this came about because we um, had someone from the NHS uh, Western Isles give a talk at the Lyme disease conference a number of years ago. And my colleague, Caroline Millens and myself were present and we learned that there's a very high incidence of, um, of Lyme disease on some of these islands uh, shown in red here. And as you can see in the, uh, in the map, um, you can see the, the incidence relative to, to the number of inhabitants. The youths um, don't have a lot of people living there, but relative to that population size, they have an exceptional high number of Lyme disease cases. You can see over 130 compared to uh, most of Scotland having uh, about six per 100,000. So um, we were interested in what might be driving uh, this, this hotspot uh, for, for Lyme disease and what might be responsible. And, um, so we started uh, doing ecolog ecological research in that environment um, by sampling the environment for ticks and sampling for the different host uh, populations um, and species that, that are present. One thing that's quite unique about the system is that most people associate Lyme disease with forested habitats, um, but the use have essentially no, no forest cover whatsoever. So this was really an example of Lyme disease emergence in a treeless uh, type of landscape. And that also means that, that type of species, the wildlife species that are maintaining um, the, the pathogen here uh, are likely to be quite different from what, we, what we're used to in, in forested ecosystems. Uh, so we're trying to understand what are the hosts that are maintaining ticks and, uh, and, and the pathogen in the system. Um, and just to give you an example of well, one of the questions we're, we're looking at is which hosts are critical for maintaining ticks. We know that deer are often associated with tick populations but obviously livestock can feed uh, ticks as well. So um, one of the questions we've asked is, is whether tick populations can be maintained in the absence of deer um, and whether tick densities are really associated with, with uh, where deer are, are most abundant and using the habitat. Um, and this just gives you, gives you a, a glimpse of the research that, that's ongoing at the moment. This is a PhD student in the lab, uh, Jonathan Yardley. Uh, who collected lots of ticks. You can see the technique that he's using, uh, dragging a piece of woolen cloth about the, uh, over the vegetation um, and doing that in a standardized way it gives us a, me a measure of, uh, of tick abundance. And then we collect these ticks, especially the nymphs. Uh, we take them to the lab and we um, determine what proportion of ticks is infected with a Lyme disease pathogen. So he did this across many different uh, sites. Uh, and here you can see the different islands that he visited in the Western Isles. Um, and from the map earlier, you, show that, uh, you saw that Harris and Barra actually don't have a high incidence of Lyme disease, but it's these three islands, North Uist, Van Bakula, and South Uist, where we see the highest incidence. Um, and that's interesting to us because actually the, the large mammal host communities are somewhat different. So on, on these, islands, both deer and, and sheep are present, uh, but on Barra and, and South Harris, um, deer are, are absent. So, um, so that gives us an interesting comparison um, for asking whether um, we really need deer in the system to, to, have, to have ticks. Uh, and this just shows you some, some results from that. So on, on this axis here, you can see the abundance of nymphs. Uh, so ticks that we got from our um, or blanket drags uh, for these five different islands. And you can see that um, 
yes, we see lots of ticks on the islands that have deer and, and sheep present, but we don't need deer uh, to maintain ticks. So both Har Abara and, and South Harris uh, had ticks as well, and in some cases um, at high densities. Um, so that implies that in this system, at least, uh, livestock probably have a role to play as well in, uh, in addition to deer. Um, and then there's a new project that uh, I just want to quickly mention um, where we also have a field site in, uh, in Scotland, in, in Tayside, um, and that project is called TICSOLVE. It uh, uh, involves many different partners. Um, it's um, a multi-million pound project funded by uh, uh, the UK uh, Research um, Council uh, for the Natural Environment. Um, so you can see the partners down there. Um, that are involved, and there's there's field two field sites, one in Scotland uh, and and one in England actually. Um, uh, it's a four-year project, and uh, one of so that some of the key questions that we're asking here is what enables tick-borne pathogens uh, to spread uh, within the landscape. So we're asking how different landscape changes might influence where ticks and, and the pathogen uh, they transmit uh, can be found. Uh, we want to understand uh, where the health risks are likely to be highest, uh, and of course what kind of invent interventions uh, might be possible uh, based on this, this better understanding. Uh, and this project focuses on uh, three different pathogens, actually, um, uh, all uh, tick-borne. Uh, Lyme disease is, is an obvious focus, given that we already know it's widespread and, um, and uh, a rising concern within, within the UK. Um, well, we also look at tick-borne encephalitis. So this brings us to the viruses. Um, and that Ben mentioned earlier, uh, uh, TBEV, uh, the virus that, that uh, causes tick-borne encephalitis, is uh, found across uh, continental Europe and uh, quite recently has been detected in the UK as well. It's, what, uh, it's very localized at this point, uh, but we're trying to understand what are the ecological conditions, what are the host communities that allow um, the virus to establish. Um, and what are the landscape, what are the environmental features that allow the virus to spread uh, across space and, and how can we use that to maybe, um, well, at the minimum, uh, get a better understanding of how risk is distributed, but maybe also intervene uh, and, and prevent um, further spread. And then a the third uh, virus that was actually mentioned uh, by Ben in, in his talk, uh, and this is one of the, the bunya viruses, uh, is Crimean uh, Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is not found in the UK, uh, but it's expanding in other parts of Europe. Um, and it's transmitted by a different type of tick, uh, but the tick has occasionally been found in the UK. And so there is um, the potential for, for the pathogen to, to arrive in the UK. And we're trying to understand how migrating birds, for example, and, um, and um, uh, migration pathways might influence uh, where we might expect um, a pathogen like this to arrive. Um, so with that, I, I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of people that are involved in this work. Uh, so the partners at University of Liverpool, uh, UK, um, CH, so these are the TICSOLF partners, uh, and then our partners from Nature Scott and NHS Western Isles uh, for the work that we're doing on the, on the Western Isles, um, as well as people um, uh, within my institute. I collaborate on this. So thanks very much, and I'm very happy to, to answer any, any questions. Thank you very much, Roman. That was really interesting. Um, if all of us, including Faye, you want to put your camera back on and put your mics back on, um, we'll start with some questions. I've got a few questions that I jotted down just before we started and while you've been speaking. And if anybody has any questions they would like to ask anybody, if you just put them in the chat box and somebody will be monitoring the chat box um, and we'll see what, what comes up. So um, from, your, from your talk, Ben, I wrote down a few notes. Um, so all the, all the different um, viruses and pathogens that you were looking at, does that say that when people from the UK go on holiday, and they come back unwell and they've had some sort of bite. And quite often they're tested for Borrelia, uh, for Lyme disease. Does anybody ever think to test them for these more exotic viruses? And it, it, should, that, should that be a feature of testing if somebody comes back very unwell? 
Uh, yeah, um, so it would really depend on where they travel to. And there's an excellent example of that with the virus, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever that, that Roman, both Roman and I mentioned, um, that, that we get imported cases uh, into the UK every couple of years. We actually had an imported case into Glasgow about five, six years ago with, with someone that traveled uh, uh, to Afghanistan, I think, or Pakistan, I can't remember which country it was, uh, for a wedding. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't get bitten by a tick, but they they were involved in uh, wedding ceremony practices that that, that involved them uh, coming into contact with an animal. And um, unfortunately, they got sick and uh, came back with Korean Congo. So it's not just tick bites, um, but, you know, uh, uh, on live, coming into contact with livestock uh, as well. And these viruses do come back. Fortunately, um, you know, these people are on the whole very sick, especially with Crimean Congo. So it, it's quite difficult to, to transmit it. And um, certainly, uh, it, you know, if uh, establishing in tick populations, it would be unlikely from a returning traveler. But certainly the, these viruses are tested for. And if you display certain symptoms, you will, you know, they, they will test you for, for those pathogens based on where you've come from. Yeah, so it is, you know, when people come to us for advice, sometimes they come back, they come to us, they've, they've just become ill, but they've been overseas maybe a few months beforehand. It's, it's worth sort of letting them know that, you know, there might be other pathogens they need testing for rather than yeah. just the basic, yeah, you know, because uh, they say, oh, I think I was bitten by a tick and obviously everybody goes to Borrelia. So that's a good thing. that's a good thing for the charity to keep in mind. I think. Yeah, the, the most important thing would be if you come back for, from a foreign trip and you are unwell in the weeks or months after you get back, go to see your GP. Uh, uh, and the most important thing is to tell them the area in which you were travelling in, because that invariably narrows down the the range of pathogens that it could be. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so from the research you're doing into various viruses, pathogens, bacteria. Is it possible from the sort of research that you're doing um, in the future, probably, because we've still got a lot to learn about ticks, whether, you know, the um, infections that they carry are, are can be persistent rather than, um, you know, a couple of weeks of antibiotics and you're fine sort of thing. You know, we, we that's one of the you know, things we have to solve with ticks, uh, Lyme disease, tick-borne illness, because that's the big divide, isn't it, when people remain mm -hmm. ill. So do you think from your work that you will be able to point to something that proves one or the other, or is that a different field? Um, it, it, I think it, it, it's a very slightly different angle on the same question, where we are not so... We're not really exploring how the virus would persist in the patient. It's more how the virus is maintained in the tick without causing any disease in the tick. And what that will allow us to understand is to, we'll get a better understanding of how these viruses are transmitted. Um, and if we, can, if we can understand or prevent a virus uh, from being spread by the tick, then we're breaking the transmission chain, which, which, is, which is an ideal thing to do. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Going to the um, research that you've been doing on the islands, Roman, the islands that are so high in ticks, is there a high percentage of Lyme disease? And is it is it recognised that, you know, people are at risk there? Oh, you're, you're muted at the moment. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So so the reason why we became involved was uh, because the NHS actually realized that there's there's a hotspot there. So the incidence was was much higher there. So that was the one map I showed that showed the US in red, um, parts of the Highland in yellow and then the rest of Scotland in, in, in green. That uh, So we have a um, at least 20 fold higher incidence uh, of Lyme disease in, in these islands. Um, and so that that um, makes them uh, particularly important place to to study this. Um, th there are some questions in, in the chat. I don't know if I, if I should. If yeah, I, should I just saw it as well. <laughs> I saw it. Um, I mean, if I can read it out. There was one about the islands, isn't there? Is it the one about the deer? 
Yeah, so there's one question, you compare US and Barra with Harris, even though they all have large tick numbers, and so livestock as well as deer are contributing to the spread of ticks, why is US with livestock and deer showing so much higher rate of Lyme disease? Um, so that's an excellent question, uh, and, and, and um, well spotted that I kind of didn't really cover that because I was talking about what, what species do we need to have deer in the system, and I said, well, uh, sorry, what species do we, have, do we need for tick maintenance, and I showed you that uh, we don't need deer necessarily, but that doesn't answer the question of why there's high incidence. And so um, this comes back to the transmission host. So we know that the type of Borrelia that exists on these islands is, is all maintained by small mammals. And so that directs our research towards the small mammal communities. Uh, so we're trapping uh, voles and shrews and, and rats. Uh, and so these are the, there aren't that many species of small mammal uh, on these islands, um, but we don't have conclusive evidence yet, but we think that one of these species must be responsible. And interestingly, a place like uh, Harris, for example, doesn't have the voles present. So that suggested to us, maybe the voles have something to do with it, but at the moment um, it's, not, it's not conclusive in, in that regard. So, um, but yeah, that's very much a focus of our current research is identifying uh, the reservoir hosts for the pathogen. Okay, thank you. That's that's really interesting. And we'll be following up all your work as you go along. There's one interesting question that people ask all the time. And I know I know it's a question um, that I always ask about mosquitoes. So if, if I go somewhere where there's a lot of mosquitoes, I'll be covered in bites within milliseconds. My husband, not one. So one of the attendees is asking, why do some people not get bitten by ticks and others do? Any ideas? No? I'm always very puzzled by that because um, as, as I said, you know, the tick is, is very much a journalist. Um, and as you can see, you know, when we drag our, our cloth across the vegetation, um, that's hardly, uh, you know, resembling a host, but they respond even to that. If there's movement, um, I mean, that's, the opportunity they've been waiting for, you know, something that's that's potentially alive and that they can get a blood meal from, so they latch onto that. Um, so there's clearly no preference at that point. What then happens, sort of, once they they attach to to a potential host and why they might be able to take uh, a, a blood meal from one and not the other, um, I can't really give you even an answer to that. There there seems to be variation. I mean, I know from from colleagues, you know, that you know some some of us seem to have much more problems with, with tick bites than, than others, but um, I really don't know what, what's underlying that. I don't know if Ben has any sort of perspective from the immunological or host. Um, no, I, I'm just as puzzled as you are. Um, anecdotally, the only thing we can say to really prevent tick bites is not being first through the brush. If you're in a party of people, make sure you're at the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what else have we got on the chat box? Let's have a look. I just had a good one that's a bit um, bit more general, um, but I was just answering. Um, it was a question about whether ticks can transmit um, viruses or bacteria if they haven't bitten. Um, and it's it's just it's quite an interesting question saying, you know, if they're just crawling on you, can they transmit? And I guess my, my answer to that is if you, for example, pop the tick, Whilst they're on it, that's a way of transmitting anything that, that, that is in them. If you know, if you pop them to kill them um, and release the blood that they're carrying, that may potentially be carrying viruses or bacteria. Um, so we always say to remove them as carefully as possible, wrap them and flush them. Um, so that was just an answer to that one. Um, and also, when if they have bitten, um, but they um, you notice quite quickly again, don't disturb them. Um, because they, if they're disturbed, they'll regurgitate whatever they have in them, even if they haven't started taking a blood meal. Um, so it's remove them as gently as possible using a proper tick remover or tweezers. Um, and then again, wrap them and flush them. Just try not to disturb them and wash your hands thoroughly afterwards. Um, but that was just a more general uh, question that I saw in the chat. Okay, thanks. Uh, going back to Roman's presentation and something that uh, very interested, uh, that I have a big interest in, is we've now had first cases of uh, tick-borne encephalitis in the UK. Are we going to see more and more tick-borne encephalitis in the UK, do you think? 
Yeah, that's um, hard to know, but in, in some ways I would say I, I'd be surprised if that wasn't the case, um, because we now know that the, the ticks carrying it are present in multiple places and we have some suspected human cases. Luckily, it's very, very rare at this point. And um, if the conditions that allow the virus to, to be maintained are very specific to, to certain environmental conditions, then maybe it will be restricted to very few places and, and, and that would be useful and that would be uh, helpful to us, but we don't know that yet, but that's part of the thing that we're trying to understand of how, how far could the virus potentially spread and, and um, is it certainly, uh, what, what's the environmental envelope in which it can exist? It's something really to keep an eye on in the future. Yeah, yeah. For, fortunately for TBEV, uh, so fortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately for TBEV, there are two, mm, albeit not very good, but there are two licensed vaccines uh, for humans. So it, it, it is vaccine preventable. So in the event of um, it becoming predominant in the UK, we could roll out a vaccine. Yeah. 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 Right, I think that's... Yeah, for some of the, the high-risk places in Europe, they're definitely making use of that. Um, did we did we have this question? Uh, you told us you told us ticks exist in South is it South Harris, Boost and Barra. Have you studied the tick numbers carrying Lyme in these separate areas? Does that mean have you have you um, have you studied the numbers in each of those areas or as a whole? I think that's what it means. Yeah, I think the, the question might also ask uh, whether we we, uh, we tested uh, what proportion of the ticks actually carry the pathogen, and we have. I didn't show you those, those data, but um, indeed we find that on Harris and Barra, uh, the ticks are um, infected to a very, very low degree, and they actually carry a, a bird-derived form of the, of the pathogen. So it's very consistent with where we see high human cases, we see a very uh, small proportion of ticks infected. But then North South US and Benbecula had uh, about 7% of the nymphs carried this small uh, mammal variant uh, of, of Borrelia. So it is consistent with that. We see, we see infected ticks in the same place where we see the high incidence of human cases. Okay, uh, this is a very topical question that comes up quite a lot, especially in rural areas. How much does the reduction of cheap sheep dipping, sorry, contribute to rise in tick numbers. Dipping was stopped because it was thought that dipping was causing illness in farmers. What is the likelihood that it was actually unidentified tick-borne infections that were the cause of the illness and stopping dipping has made the problem worse? Anybody want to yeah, I think, I think that there's two, yeah, it's definitely an, an issue that we're also looking at. Uh, so the PhD student, uh, Johnny, who, who I showed in, in, in my talk and, and mentioned, he's currently, uh, undergoing surveys uh, with with livestock owners uh, to find out exactly that sort of to what extent are they treating their, their sheep uh, and he does that for the same sites where he sampled for ticks so we're trying to understand how uh, different treatment practices might have influenced um, tick abundance um, so it's quite possible that changing practices with respect to um, sheep dipping have uh, a role to play in this um, I think there's a separate issue here is whether the illness uh, might be caused by something else. I think that's that's separate. I mean, I think there's no question that that the, the chemicals that are used for dipping are potentially harmful, but they might well have a role to play in controlling tick numbers. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting that they are um, uh, harmful chemicals, but um, yeah, clearly um, they, they, they can have... Um, they might be part of a, of a tick control strategy. Okay, uh, this is an interesting question because people come to us uh, after the tick bite, um, they've removed the tick, and they ask about whether it's worth testing the tick. So uh, the, the actual question is, which test do you use to determine if a tick is infected? And do you think if somebody has a tick bite, that it's worth them sending that off, even though it can't confirm that any uh, infection has been passed on is it worth checking if the tick is carrying any dna of any infection i mean i can i can answer from a personal perspective i mean we, we use pcr to um 
find the, the DNA of the of the pathogen. Uh, and even if I had a tick bite, I don't uh, test the tick. I try to remove the tick as, as quickly as possible and, and then uh, watch out for, for symptoms of, of a flu-like illness and, and, uh, and others um, so that I could seek treatment uh, if necessary. But um, I know there's some commercial services that offer testing the ticks, but um, I'm not sure how reliable that is and, and whether that really is um, providing uh, much useful information. Because as you say, even if the tick was infected, it doesn't mean that it has transmitted if you removed it quickly. No, and, you know, I mean, um, these uh, companies who do this sort of thing, they don't charge just a few pennies. So mm. when people are considering that, you know, it's good to get advice from somebody like myself um, so, so that we can give, you know, clear advice to people. I mean, obviously, it's up to that person if they do test the tick, but it's, it's good to have some background knowledge. I, I think I think it's also important here that uh, people try to either get a photo a photo of the tick once they've removed it. That will really help uh, physicians and other people in, in the absence of genetic testing and in the absence of PCR to really narrow down what pathogen it could be because uh, we don't really understand. But it's one of, one of the things we're looking at in our studies that. Uh, certain species of tick seem to uh, transmit certain viruses and others don't and we don't really understand why or, or not so I identify being able to identify the species of tick that you've been bitten by might help a physician narrow down what could be causing any disease that you might have okay thanks that's some good advice we can pass on uh what else have we got in here So this is an interesting one. So um, what are your thoughts on the links between um, Lyme disease and the other condition, PANS pandas, which um, we have people coming to us when mainly children are unwell. PANS pandas um, can be caused by high levels of strep, but there's some thoughts that Lyme disease can cause this condition too. Um, what's she, what's they written? So, so they're looking at Lyme disease and co-infections, particularly Bartonella. Would you think that they, they could be linked to these sort of conditions that not only cause um, you know, Lyme-like symptoms, but they can also cause neuropsychiatric um, symptoms, which are obviously very distressing for a child. Do you think there's a link between Lyme disease and the other condition? I mean, I know that your field isn't in, <laughs> but is, is, it a is it a thought? I don't know. So that definitely feels like something that's outside of my, my <laughs> expertise. So I think my, my opinion there is, is no, worth no more than, than that of a, of a lay person, I'm afraid. So uh, uh, yeah, I'm afraid me too. But um, the, the other, the, what we, we are looking at the, the other end of the spectrum and co-infections uh, within the ticks themselves. and. There are some studies or emerging fields that show that um, the bacteria that ticks normally have in their gut might be uh, able to amplify the ability of ticks to transmit viruses or indeed the opposite to prevent them from spreading viruses. And we need to understand that interaction to really understand how, you know, what that might contribute to why the ticks are transmitting these viruses. OK, that's great. Um, a question for Faye. Can you give us all the reasons that what makes viruses tick came about? Because it's such an interesting project. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting one for this group. The main reason was Ben uh, coming to me when I started saying, why does no one know that, that, that ticks carry anything other than Lyme? And that was a really interesting thing, especially in Scotland. And it was um, a big thing that he want, like, wanted to raise the profile of the lab without being... Um, I guess, you know, forgetting about all of the people in Scotland that are living with Lyme. Um, so we kind of put our heads together and thought of the lots of different ways that we could kind of engage loads of different groups um, in ticks. And thinking of tick-borne viruses, you know, they're not necessary in the UK yet, but obviously they're in the um, on the continent. And um, it was very much at a time when COVID had kind of come about very quickly for people. And we thought about preparedness. And something that, you know, the, the more people were out and about in the outdoors as well, especially people from um, cities 
um, especially around Glasgow, getting out and about more um, in the hills and hill walking becoming such a big thing. So lots more people who wouldn't before have come into contact with ticks were starting to. Um, and this was kind of a concern to us. So we kind of started off by putting some feelers out with, um, you know, kind of local country parks and um, some of the um, other national kind of um, places like Loch Lomond and the Trossets National Park, for example, and said, you know, was there a need for kind of support with raising awareness? And one thing that a lot of people said is what would be really good is if we could actually start kind of quantifying sort of where the ticks are and also Ben's group needing to supplement the ticks in the lab um, as well. So we kind of put all of these things together um, and went to the Medical Research Council and asked for a bit of pilot funding to just kind of trial a citizen science project getting people whilst they're out and about if they do get bitten by a tick to, to let us know. Um, and this was really, really successful over the first summer. We got over 200 sightings. Um, and this really informed kind of where we should be raising awareness. It helped us um, inform land management, for example. So the West Highland Way have actually done a lot of land management as part of their paths that were overgrown because lots of people were reporting tick bitings there. And it's just enabled us to help lots of different charities and lots of different organisations with various things, whilst also raising the profile of the work that's done at the University of Glasgow. And this is where we brought um, Roman in. Roman's one of our key partners on the next part of the project, which is kind of taking the project to the communities who are most affected. Um, as the project was mainly run online last year, we were actually missing out on a lot of our key, the key people who are most vulnerable from emerging um, and current tick-borne diseases in the Highlands and Islands. Um, so the next iteration of the project is uh, we've got two and a half years worth of funding and we're going to be working with three different community groups, hopefully we think in Harris, um, US and up in Orkney. Um, to really understand the kind of burden of ticks um, and tick-borne diseases up there and work with communities to um, spread the word and raise awareness in a way that is um, appropriate to them. Um, so yeah, that's in a nutshell the project where it kind of started, where it's gone and where it's going to. Um, and Rowan and team and Lucy and Caroline have been absolutely fantastic in supporting us with the kind of uh, direction for our community work um, and yeah, have jumped on board and got involved with everything I've thrown at them. So that's yeah, great. I know as a charity, we've been, um, I think it was me who picked it up first and was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> I need to know about this. And our charity has been uh, very keen to follow you, share yeah. your work. And as, as I was saying earlier, I'm really thankful for that because at least half of the sightings that we've had since we relaunched the map, um, it was only at the end of April we relaunched it and we've nearly gone over 500 sightings now. So if, in the, if you imagine the first summer we had 200 and in about six weeks we've had nearly 300 wow. um, so, um, and about I would say half of those have come through um, LD UK so it's been like it's been really really brilliant and also one of our lovely um, senior school students who wrote a blog um, for you as well so it's been a really great opportunity for a lot of our team to get involved so we are very thankful um, to everyone at LD UK. And if anybody wants to read that blog, it's on our website, Lyme Disease UK, and there's a, a lot of information about what makes viruses tick. Do you ever envisage that funding will come about where your project could be expanded for the whole of the country? Because it would be very interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the funding that we've got is from the Welcomes, um, from the Welcome Trust. So we are branching out um, and we have started, especially through LD UK, we've started having people reporting from Exeter, even inner city London and mm -hmm. um, places like that. And the idea is, is that the, the, all the data that we're given is completely GDPR compliant. So we are able to share this with any network and any kind of body that is interested in using this. Um, so, for example, we've started um, working with um, a people vector map, which is actually part of the Smithsonian um, Museum in Washington, D.C., um, who have a huge amount of data and they're happy to share with us and vice versa. Um, but also, you know, this any any things that arise from this that may be of public health concern. Obviously, that's something that we can share with um, the various public health bodies. But anyone who's interested in using our data and, for example, Lime, Lime Resource Centre have a lot of work going on with GPs and things in um, in London and the South who are really interested in seeing kind of pockets of uh, any sightings that we can share. That's brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Just seen Arlene in the chat, <laughs> Lime yeah. Resource Centre. I know yeah, Arlene's there somewhere. I know she's there. <laughs> um, well, we've come up to um, our hour, unbelievably. Um, it's been amazing, guys. It really has been amazing. I've been really looking forward to this session. 
and I'll be going away thinking of all sorts of questions and I'm sure other people will. It's difficult to answer every question that people come up with. Um, but I'd just like to say on behalf of the charity, thank, to, thank you to you all. I mean, it's been great sort of engaging with you. I know um, I've spoken to Sam a lot and he's been brilliant passing on information. And just thank you for, you know, saying that you take part tonight. It's really important that all the charities, organisations like you, we all work together and, you know, we can only move forward if um, we do all collaborate as far as I'm concerned. So again, massive thank you from the, the whole team at the charity and um, everybody, like I said at the beginning, everybody get a recording of this um, seminar. It will appear on our website with an overview of all we've talked about tonight. I'll make sure the links on the website piece where people can um, let you know their site in and everything, make sure that links on there. And um, yeah, amazing work, amazing work. I'm just so impressed. So um, I'm gonna end the um, a seminar for everybody. Um, and just, I hope everybody who's attended has enjoyed it. And it's food for thought. And please, guys, just keep working hard, working hard. We need, we need you all to move tick-borne illnesses forward in the UK. Yeah. Thanks so much, Julia. And I'm going to save the chat as well, and I'll answer any questions that we've missed. Um, the three of us will kind of have a look through them, and we can um, send that to you, Julia, so you can pop that on the website as well. Yeah, um, that'd be brilliant. That's that'd helpful. be really brilliant. Thank you, everybody, and um, good night to everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thanks Bye. very much. See you later. Bye. Bye, Bye now.